Hello and welcome to One on One. I'm Vernon Ramson. I'm very pleased to say my guest today is Dr. Armando Garcia, who is a lecturer at the Department of History, Faculty of Humanities and Education at UWE, and he's here to talk about a conference coming up on the Indian diaspora. Welcome to the program, Dr. Thank you very much, Vernon. Thank you very much for being here. Never had you on before, so welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank uh, well, let's talk about this conference. It's going to be the 170th anniversary of Indian arrival. It seems like just the other day, the 150th, but apparently time has since passed. Uh, what's the purpose behind the conference? Right. Well, the purpose of the conference is to um, provide a forum for different scholarly views on the experience of the Indian diaspora, in the, particularly in Trinidad and Tobago, the Caribbean, and the world. And it's an opportunity to bring together all these different scholars, academics, and people who write and present and create on this topic uh, to come to Trinidad and present their views and, and share their, um, their, their expertise and, and their work with us. No, of course, there will be those who will ask, well, why is this Spanish, Hispanic gentleman uh, here talking about an Indian diaspora? <laughs> and I guess you're a lecturer in history, so it makes no difference, really. Correct, yes. Well, the, actually, the Department of History at the University of West Indies is hosting the conference, and I'm a member of the organizing committee. It's, um, we have um, a couple of, um, of lecturers in, on the organizing committee, and I'm one of the point persons to promote and, um, and, and give more um, uh, exposure to, to this event. So definitely there, there are different scholars mm -hmm. on, on, on the committee. So I'm, I'm glad to be on this committee. And we should mention it's happening very shortly. It's happening on Tuesday the 12th till, and going till the 16th. Correct. Um, tomorrow, eve tomorrow evening? Tomorrow today, Tuesday, depending Tuesday, on people are watching. Yeah. Tuesday, okay, depending on what we're watching. Right? So Tuesday, um, May 12th is the opening ceremony, but the official sessions begin on Wednesday the 13th. So it'll be Wednesday, Thursday, uh, till Friday, so from basically the 13th through the 15th will be the academic sessions. So during the morning, uh, 9 a.m. to 4.30 p.m., we'll be running 11 panels and 50 presenters from around the world. We have presenters coming from the UK, the Netherlands, Canada. Um, we have presentations even coming from Latin America, from Argentina, and they're all uh, looking at the Indian diasporic experience. Anybody the world. from India, by any chance? Uh, yes, we do. We have um, several prominent Indian scholars coming, and also we have um, people coming from also from uh, from from South Africa. And, no, I love with academic conferences because you always have tremendously, to me, entertaining titles because it's almost difficult for the average person to understand. So the title of this one is the Indian diaspora. We all get that part. Identities, trajectories, and transnationalities. Tell me about that choice of, of theme. Well, I think that that is the overarching theme. Uh, I, I think they're very related to the Indian diasporic experience, the, the issue of identity, how identity is defined and how it's been um, created through the decades and, and the centuries, and also trajectories, which gives, um, gives meaning to the whole sense of the path, you know, mm -hmm. the path, the voyage, the journey, uh, not only the journey through history, but the journey al also through uh, daily life that, that um, uh, the children of the Indian diaspora have experienced. Also transnationalities, we see, you know, um, the Indian diaspora uh, tra tra transcending nationalities and, and, and we see this, um, you know, uh, let's say if we are originally coming from India to the Caribbean, then we see from the Caribbean going to the UK or going mm -hmm. to Canada. So it's, it's all, tr it's an overarching theme that tries to bring together the multifaceted character of the Indian diaspora. It's, it's a very complex topic when you think about it, isn't it? I mean, because even within the, the first word, identities, we all carry within us multiple identities. And I guess the Indian identity will fall within one of those identities that some people have. Correct, correct, absolutely. If you're an Indo-Trinidadian, you, you have that identity, but you're also a Caribbean person, you're also a Trinidadian, you're also whatever else you may be in your life. Correct, absolutely. We have many identities, right? I mean, yesterday was, um, we recently had Mother's Day, mm -hmm. and that's a, a strong identity for many people to be a mother, right? So definitely, in this sense, in the Indian Diaspora Conference, what we're looking for is um, these experiences of how identity is shaped, how identity is created, and, and how communities, individuals have identified themselves. Would it be fair to say that within any territory where, where, the, where Indians have ended up, that their experience is shaped through the lens of that particular area? Like would a, a Trini Indian be fundamentally rather different to a Canadian Indian or, or somebody from Europe, or a UK Indian or as opposed to a mainland Europe Indian? 
Well, definitely, definitely. Um, we, we see that everything is different according to its context, right, right. and its environment. So definitely, um, in Trinidad and Tobago has a very particular experience. I would say that um, within Trinidad and Tobago, probably the more similarities with other areas of the Caribbean because we can share as a Caribbean mm -hmm. different similar contexts. But definitely there will be huge difference. I mean, there will be differences between communities in, um, in Canada or in Europe. But nevertheless, there is a certain core that is, that is shared, a certain core that is shared nevertheless. But definitely, I think that Trinidad, also in Trinidad and Tobago, the Indian diasporic experience has taken on a life of its own. Mm -hmm. um, we see even uh, many similarities and commonalities with other Indian diasporas in other parts of the Caribbean, but yet there are also some differences that are unique to uh, the, I the twin island nation itself. I suppose time creates different identities as well, doesn't it? Because, I mean, the Trini Indian identity is shaped over 170 years in some cases in terms of families, whereas with new migrants, in other parts of the world, it would be a very different experience, wouldn't it? The identity would be rather different. You're Correct. bringing it through current India as opposed to an ancestral memory of what India was. Correct. Well, there have been studies that have um, explained how when people leave an area, let's say when you have migrants or people leaving an area, they usually leave that area with a memory of the point in time they left. Mm -hmm. So in, in, many ex in, in many instances, for example, if somebody li leaves India, let's say, in 1880, the India they imagine is the one of 1880. The, uh, if someone leaves India in 1910, the, the India they imagine is 1910. So it's, it's very interesting to see that um, although this culture f in, in Trinidad has, is a significant and important component of, of Trimbagonian culture, may, in many ways it's, it's, it's distinct from India itself as India has had a different trajectory um, we see the Indian, um, the Indians that came to Trinidad and Tobago came while it was still British India. It, it, we still did not mm -hmm. have, you know, an independent Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh as we do today. So in those, in, in that case, there definitely are some uh, differences as, as far as how you imagine that identity and, and, and what is the India that is recreated and transferred from generation to generation. And that identity and that, um, and, and that culture that's transferred from, from generation to, 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 the, to, to, to future ones is also done in the context of the environment as you relate to other different cultures. I mean, we see Trent Tobago is a very vibrant, dynamic place as far as, uh, as far as cultures we're talking. You know, there's so many different cultures from around the world here on a relatively, um, small nation if we compare it to, you know, country, we, we compare it to, you know, other countries of the globe. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, it's very rich and very uh, significantly important for a historical study as far as um, the, the, the vibrancy of cultures we have, see, we have here. What you were talking about there reminds me a bit of, of the discussions about um, the culture of Quebec in Canada. You, you have the French from France saying they speak funny and then somebody explained to them, no, they're speaking the way a Frenchman, a bourgeois Correct. Frenchman, from centuries ago would have spoken Correct. because that's when they would have gone over. So they carry, Correct. they start from that point and then develop their own sense of Correct. self, don't they? Correct. Correct. In the case of Quebec, most of them they speak, you know, French, many say from the 17th century mm -hmm. because it's like when the colony uh, was established there. But um, it, that's exactly the point. When people leave a place, they usually remember it at the time they left. And, and then something new begins. Something new begins, and based on that memory, new things are added onto it, and we see. So it becomes a layered sort of culture and expression. At that correct. Point. I mean, and then also you have cultural adaptations to the environment. Like we look at the Trini doubles, you mm -hmm. know, very famous Trini doubles. That's a very we see an, an Indian-inspired Indian influence, you know, with its with its basis in India, but at the same time, it's a very Trini product. It doesn't exist in India. Correct. It's a very Trini product. Well, even like I guess the roti that apparently we eat here, it's similar but not exactly the same as you would have in India. Correct, correct. I, I, I know a lot of people actually from India, and many of them say that they're fascinated by Trinidad culture because it seems to be a different time. It's reflective of a different time to them. Uh, and, and I also know the Indians I, I, I'm familiar with. They're a very forward-looking culture. Everything's very pragmatic. Whereas here, we're more nostalgic, aren't we? And I guess you would see that in any diaspora, that there's a, a level of nostalgia within the communities. Mm -hmm. Correct, definitely. Um, 
this is something you don't want to give up. Usually diaspora communities don't want to give up mm -hmm. that, that um, you know, the, the mother culture, the mother... Romantic notions yeah, the of the romantic mother Romantic notion of this mother, uh, of this place, of this pure, pristine place that you come from. And that is something that is, that is, that is shared with many other diaspora cultures in the world. Um, but uh, the truth is that, you know, there, there's always culture, something's constantly shifting and changing. And the way certain groups imagine a culture is not necessarily not the other same group might, might imagine it. So um, I think that in the case of Trinidad, it's, it's very interesting because, um, like you said, compared to India today, you know, India today has a different path. Mm -hmm. And, the, you know, the Indian diaspora community in Trinidad and Tobago is part of a nation, Trinidad and Tobago, which is, which is completely distinct from India. So... Um, in a way, it's 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 something that's very interesting, interesting to study, very unique, and and and, and we're very happy that this um, that that this well, we're going to be dealing with these same issues at the conference. I suppose it's very telling when you mentioned the fact that the diaspora communities are very different from the homeland community. That because of the, the modern world, many Trinidadians will go to India to visit or perhaps for a longer stay, mm -hmm. and you invariably hear about culture shock because their expectation is not what they, what they meet and they're certainly not accepted as part of Indian society just because they look alike. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of emblematic of the whole thing, isn't it, really? Correct. Well, it's been so long. I mean, we're celebrating 170 years, commemorating 170 years of Indian arrival. We think it's been a very long time. Like, I, mm -hmm. you, know, it, you know, time has passed. And I think that perhaps if someone from Trinidad went back to India in 1920 or 1910, perhaps there would have the differences wouldn't have been so wide, but because if we're going now in the 21st century, definitely there's a, there's a long path there. Time has passed, right. and definitely the two nations and, and have have gone in very distinct trajectories. But yet there is definitely commonalities there, and, and you know there are common core elements that are, that are still shared. Well, I guess it would depend on how many common core elements as well, wouldn't it? Because I mean, some, it depends on the vectors that connect the the outboard out community to the, the homeland, if you will, because if your only exposure to Indian culture where you are is Indian Bollywood film, and you suddenly get dumped into the main culture, it, it will bear no, or little or no resemblance, will it? Correct. A lot less singing and dancing, I'd imagine. Correct. And also another thing we have to also consider is that India is a very diverse country. When we think of all the different regions of India, all the different languages of India, so in many, in, in many ways, you know, someone that arrives in India you would have to see what part of India you're, you're arriving in, because even within Indi India, there are a lot of differences, and, and uh, you know, it's a very culturally diverse, ethnically and religiously diverse place. That's very interesting point, because most of place. the Indians would have come from a few areas, Bihar, Uttar Pradesh, some of the poorer areas of India. But the exposure now, would, they, it would have no resemblance to Delhi, for example, or to the south of India. Well. It, it's we're in a modern age now you know right. it's 21st century definitely very distinct places from where you know the the indians came for, uh, from trinidad in fact when the indians came pakistan and bangladesh didn't exist right mm -hmm. so um the things like that so but but what i'm really excited about is this conference is going to be covering all these issues in a very academic sense but also in a very accessible and an entertaining way as well because in the evening we're going to be having um, cultural events. We're going to be having Indian dance, Indian music on, on the um, 13th in the evening, on the night of the 13th, on the night of the 14th, we're going to be having a short mini film festival of uh, Indo-Trini films, short films. We're going to be having uh, Kuli Green and Pink, uh, Doubles with Slight Pepper. We're going to have films by Yao. Uh, my cousin, yeah. Correct. <laughs> so, so little plug it's, there. It's yeah. going to be, uh, you know, it's going to be we don't want you know it's going to be it, it, the conference is definitely going to be an academic scholarly endeavor and which we would like to share with the public because i think that is the university's it, mission it is open to the public is it it is open to the public as uh, if, a, if a member of the public wants to come as a spectator, as, as an observer, they're welcome to come. It's open to the public. If they would like conference papers and would like to be involved, for example, in the meals and all that, there's going to be a registration fee. So um, it's open to the public. If you want to sit in one of the sessions and, and, and watch and, and see, it's open to the public. Definitely. Uh, as you mentioned, it is meant to be an academic conference. So 
the average person may be a little bit swamped <laughs> if they sort of throw themselves in the deep end into some of the more complex topics that are being examined. And, and you, we have a little list here of some of the themes. Um, it really covers a broad range of areas, doesn't it? Yes. We have 11 panels and 44 uh, presenters presenting on basically very diverse themes. We had, for example, indentured labor, sources, scholarship, and research. We have the early years in Trinidad, indenture, the estates and beyond. Uh, from Indian to Trimbagonian, trial, tribulation, and triumph, Indian religions in Trinidad and Tobago, preservation, conservation, and hybridization, identities and ethnicities in the Indian diaspora, psychosociological dimensions of the diaspora, economic science and technology, cross-cultural ex ex exchanges, so on and so forth. So we have, you even know... Even sexuality and gender, so you could pretty well oh, cover Oh, correct. It. We even have sexuality and multiculturalism. You know, it's covering a lot of different facets and aspects of, of the diasporic experience. And, and, I, and I suppose you would hope people would take away from this a bit more knowledge of the, of the whole idea of the diaspora and get a better, clearer picture of the overall health or just state of the diaspora if they attended the conference. Definitely. Well, they'll be caught up with the most current research on it, right? So we all want to be updated on our knowledge. But it's also going to, like you, like you said, it, it will also um, immerse them in, in, in what is the most recent cutting edge research in diasporic studies, particularly the Indian diaspora. And we'll look at all these dimensions. There are papers that are even looking at the Indian diaspora in Latin America, which is something that perhaps is more recent, mm -hmm. okay? We could say probably it's a 20th century phenomenon. Uh, in Latin America, we have a paper on, on the Indian diaspora in Argentina. So we, we have, we're looking at it also as in, in different international contexts. So I think it's, it's, it'll be very interesting. And, um, and like I said, I think the nice mixture of having the day panels with scholarly topics and academic topics and in the evening having, you know, cultural events, dance, music. A little more music. laid back approach. Yes, yeah. and it'll, it'll refresh, it'll be refreshing. Um, from spending the whole day, perhaps, you know, talking Immerse. serious topics. Now, in, in terms of the health of, of the, the whole subject matter, in terms of your department, the Department of History, is mm -hmm. it an active field of study? Are there a lot of, of people involved in it right now? Definitely. It's a big, it's a significant uh, component of our historical program at the University of the West Indies. Uh, we have a, a strong student base in our uh, bachelor's program and also in our postgraduate program that study um, Indian diasporic uh, history and history of India itself too. So um, it, it's definitely an aspect that's, that's getting more and more interest in recent years. So it's not dying anytime soon, it's definitely no, no, very, no, very no. active. History never dies. And neither does this aspect of history. It's a very fascinating element of our global history. So um, we still have students that are, that are engaged and, and pursuing degrees in this. It's interesting when, when you look at, at the history of, of the Indian identity in Trinidad and Tobago and the Indian presence in Trinidad and Tobago, that it, there's been a, a strange sort of turn of the tide over the last maybe a decade and a half really where it's become much more integrated into the national fabric and I think I've had a couple of historians come on and say and that is directly as a result of Bastio Pandey being Prime Minister it gave a sense of, of stronger sense of, of importance and identity to the Indian community would that be a fair assessment? I'm not I sure if it's your area so. of study but I mean yeah. uh, I would say so and I would say also with more uh, recent generations it's definitely becoming more and more mainstream in, in Trinidad and Tobago. Because it used to be in days gone by, like maybe 20 years ago, 30 years ago, uh, every time there's a national event, they would perhaps drag out the usual dance troupe and sort of throw it on there. But now it's integrated in the whole fabric of, of the cultural presentation representing Trinidad and Tobago. Correct, 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 correct. And I think in a way it's come of age, in a way it's, mm -hmm. it's, um, it's, it's become more of part of the fabric of, of the national identity and, 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 and national profile, what, what the nation is. And I think it's, it's a very positive, it's a very positive aspect, it's a very positive event. Is the Indian diaspora experience a unique experience or can you say that if you look at any basic ethnic group that has sort of scattered itself around the world, let's say Jews, whatever, that there would be a similarity in the experience? Or is there something distinct about it? Well, all diasporas in a way, they're different. I mean, if we look at the African diaspora, it's, it's different. There are many African diasporas. For mm -hmm. example, if we have the traditional a diaspora of Africa that we think of, and of, you know, of the, <clears throat> of the for example, the early, uh, of the transatlantic uh, trade and enslavement mm -hmm. and all that. But then we think about an African diaspora of also of indentureship. Many Africans came to Trinidad and Tobago under also an indenture contract. And then we also see, you know, the more recent African diaspora coming out of Africa and Europe and North America. So, you know, many diaspora, so, 
if we have the African diaspora, we have, let's say, the Jewish diaspora you mentioned. We mentioned other, From whence the term you know, comes, Arabic yeah. diaspora. Yeah. If, we, if we think about, you know, uh, a modern Caribbean diaspora that's leaving the Caribbean and we see them in UK and Canada and places like that. So every diaspora in a way is different, but yet there are common shared elements of, for example, memory, memory, trying to not lose that piece of, of culture, of land that um, you, you identify with and you came from, and there's this, this kind of, there's this struggle between preservation and adaptation of also, and, and in many instances, we're looking at the different historical period, you know, how the diaspora community tries to preserve its identity, either through language, religion, uh, customs, vis-a-vis -vis the, um, the pressures of the outside of, of, the, of, of the larger national mm -hmm. mainstream, no? So we see that diaspora struggle with that. And, um, and I think that in certain diasporas, you know, uh, they have been more resilient in maintaining that because perhaps, you know, they, they have, let's say, you know, a, a religion tied to it, uh, a whole ideology tied to it. We could see that with certain aspects of the Indian diaspora, with, for example, with the religions that were brought over from India, we see that with the Jewish diaspora, with Judaism, right, so. And I guess ultimately all of us want a sense of belonging to something, and therefore that's one of the areas we feel we can belong to is our cultural background. Mm -hmm. it, it's interesting you mentioned the African diaspora, and I, it made me think that we can really drill down into diasporas to make them sort of sub-diasporas, if you will, as well, because Africa is not a homogenous whole. So you would have maybe perhaps somebody from the South African diaspora or the Ghanaian diaspora. Could the same be said for India? There would, there would be individual areas of India where they would have a strong identity as belonging to that region, even perhaps more so than they think of themselves as Indians from the larger India. Absolutely, absolutely. I know they're, Punjabis seem to fall, fall into that category around the world. Yes, and they're exactly. They're, they're within India itself, there are diverse diasporas and that went around the world, right? But also even within the Indian subcontinent, you see sometimes, you know, uh, diasporic migrations going from one region of India to another, uh, let's say, eastern part of India or northern part of India. So we see also, you know, these types. So I, I think when we talk about Indian diaspora, it's kind of become somewhat, it's a very sensitive topic, but it's come on some, somewhat homogenized, we would mm -hmm. say, in Trinidad and Tobago because of this idea of, you know, of, 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 you know, of Indian diaspora. But if we look at, like I said, India is a very diverse place and, and very different distinct, you know, distinctive regions, cultures and all that. I think in Trinidad and Tobago, because of the space, okay, we're an island nation, okay, there's a limited amount of space, and also um, you have the, 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 the proximity of Indians coming, sharing, coming together, identifying as uh, with a similar experience, this served to uh, uh, highlight the commonalities between those differences. It's almost like a crucible, uh, I would exactly. as a crucible. If, if somebody's interested in registering to, for the conference, how would they go about doing it? They could do it at the Teaching and Learning Complex at the University of the West Indies, where the conference itself will be held as of Tuesday, um, Tuesday the 12th at noon. Uh, there will be uh, registration is will, will be open and there'll be registration during the whole day. Registration is 600 TT for the three days or 200 TT for a day session. That's very affordable when you think about it. Yes. I'm not really affordable. familiar with you because I never attended, but um, if in, in terms of where the location of, uh, is it on the main campus of, of UV? Correct, it's on the main campus, it's in St. Augustine, and it is, uh, it's, it's, the new, it's a newer building of UE, so it's, it's kind of on the, on the northern side of the campus, it's on the northern end of the mm -hmm. campus, um, and it's, uh, it's a teaching and learning complex. So it's a big sign, no way people can miss it. It's a brand new building. And, um, now, if this turns out to be an enormous success, are you going to continue perhaps having it as an annual event? Or? Well, it'll only be 171 next year, I understand, which is not yes, that significant um, to date. Well, you know, it's, it's definitely a topic that's very, that, that, that is very um, compelling. Uh, we find it we find it a little bit difficult to have a conference of this magnitude every year. Well, that's one of the planners. <laughs> Just the logistics of it. Yeah. But um, but definitely it's something that we would love for perhaps other universities also in the world to take it up. And there are you know there are diaspora conferences that go on. How long has this been in the making organizing this conference? O over a year. 
Oh over yeah, a year I would say months. almost, yeah, over Of a intense year. frustration, trying to book people's schedules and work Correct. around schedules, et cetera, et cetera. Seeking sponsors and right. all that. And we've been very blessed by having, you know, some sponsorship from this, which um, uh, we're, we're, we're acknowledging at the conference. So, um, yes, I think the challenge is, for example, finding the sponsorship. And I think that, ironically, sometimes um, we think we, you would assume that certain entities would mm -hmm. sponsor something like not this. Not naming any and, names or anything. Correct. Right? And unfortunately, they, would not, they did not sponsor it. So um, it, it's, it's, to me, in fact, it was a little bit shocking to find that. And we should mention it's also being done in cooperation with the Indian High Commission in Trinidad and Tobago. Correct. Yeah. The Indian High Commission is, um, is, has, has offered to host uh, you know, uh, a dinner reception for the presenters. And the Indian High Commission has, has, has offered a lot, of their, a lot of their support for this conference. So um, thank you for bringing that up. Yes. Well, Dr. Armando Garcia, it's my pleasure bringing it up. It sounds like a great conference, really interesting, and I wish you all the best with it. Thank you very much. Thank you much. very much, and thank you thank for you. having me on your show. Thank you for thank being you. on. Thank best you. Best of luck. Thank You've you. been watching 101. Join us again tomorrow for another edition.